Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sarah Platt with the Maine Department of Education Child Nutrition Programs, and welcome to today's monthly webinar series. We are going to focus on the lunch meal pattern requirements today. Before we begin, I just want to let you know that all attendees have been placed on mute. There is going to be time for questions at the end of the webinar. If you do have a question, you can type it in the question box on your screen. And also the webinar is being recorded so that you can view it at any time um, after today's session. There will be certificates of attendance that will be emailed out once the webinar has concluded. So you can look for those um, in the email address that you used when you register for today's webinar. So now let's get started with um, an overview of the National School Lunch Program meal pattern requirements. So to begin with, with the National School Lunch Program, we use a food-based menu planning process. So that means we plan meals based on five food components. This is a chart of the National School Lunch Program meal pattern. There was also a handout uploaded to the webinar um, that you can use to reference as well. As you can see on your screen, the left-hand side has the five food components listed. So these are food components that must be offered to all students every single day for lunch. So you must offer milk, you must offer fruit, you must offer vegetables, you must offer grains, and you must offer meat or meat alternate components every single day at lunch. Later on in the webinar, We'll talk about what the student has to select to make a reimbursable meal, but everything that we're talking about right now is what you, the school nutrition program, must offer, must make available to students. The meal pattern is also is broken down into three age or grade groups. So there's specific amounts of the food components that must be offered every single day and over the course of the week based on the different age or grade groupings that you serve at your school. So for example, with fluid milk, you must offer one cup every single day, and over the course of the week, you need to make sure you've offered five cups, um, and that's true for all grade groupings there. For fruit, for grades K through five and six through eight, you must offer to students a half cup fruit every single day, and over the course of the week, you must make sure that two and a half cups have been offered to students. At the high school level, grades nine through 12, you must offer one cup of fruit every single day and five cups over the course of the week. For vegetables, you must offer, for grades K through eight, um, three quarter cup of vegetables must be offered at a minimum every single day and over the course of the week, needs to be three and three quarters cups that's been offered. At grades nine through 12 level, you must offer one cup of vegetable every single day and five cups over the course of the week. With the grains that you offer, you must offer one ounce equivalent of grain every single day for grades K through eight and eight ounces over the course of the week. So what you can see there is that if you are only offering that minimum amount of one ounce equivalent of grain every day, assuming there's five school days in a week, you wouldn't meet your minimum weekly offering. At high school, you must offer two ounce equivalents of grain every single day. And if you do that every single day, you will meet your weekly minimum of 10 ounce equivalent. So what that means for grades K through eight, while it's okay to offer a one ounce equivalent grain on some days, you will wanna make sure you have other days where you've offered more than that to make sure you meet your weekly minimum. And for meat, meat alternate, you must offer one ounce equivalent of meat, meat alternate every single day, grades K through eight. But there's also the weekly minimums here as well. So for K5, it's eight ounce equivalents over the course of the week that must be offered. For grades six through eight, it's nine ounce equivalents that must be offered over the course of the week. And in high school, you must offer two ounce equivalents, meat, meat alternate every single day, and 10 ounce equivalents over the course of the week. So we're gonna go into each of the food components that we just touched on. 
We're going to start with milk. Milk is required to be offered every single day at lunch. You must offer one cup or eight ounces for all age grade groups. You also must offer two choices or two types of milk from any of the following options. It can be a fat-free flavored milk, fat-free or skim white milk, or 1% white milk. So you must offer two choices from those three types of milk. When making milk substitutions, it's never okay to substitute juice or water for milk. Nutritionally, they're not equivalent. Um, they're not even close to being equivalent, and that's not an allowable substitution for milk. Talking about substitutions would be a topic for another day, so if you, ever you do have questions on what are appropriate milk substitutions, feel free to contact any of the reviewers in our office, um, and we can assist you with that. Moving on to the fruit component, when offering fruit, it can be fresh, frozen, dried, it could be 100% fruit juice, or it can even be canned fruit as long as it's in 100% juice, light syrup, or water. A couple things to keep in mind when offering fruit. If you are going to offer 100% fruit juice as a fruit offering, you need to make sure that no more than half of your weekly offerings are in the form of juice. So it's not okay to only offer fruit juice as your fruit choice every single day of the week. If offering fruit, I would recommend you also put, excuse me, if you're offering fruit juice, I recommend you also put out another type of fruit such as canned, frozen, fresh, in addition to that fruit juice, and then you will always um, be compliant with this requirement. And with dried fruit, such as raisins or craisins, it's a quarter cup serving of dried fruit that's equivalent to a half cup serving. Moving on to the vegetable subgroup, like the other components we've talked about, vegetables must be offered every single day to all students. And the regulations require that a variety, or we call them subgroups, um, vegetable subgroups be offered over the course of the week to students. So you must offer vegetables every single day. The vegetable subgroups need to be addressed over the course of the week. Something to keep in mind is that when offering raw leafy greens such as baby spinach or romaine lettuce, it takes one cup of the raw leafy greens to equal a half cup serving. When offering beans and legumes, they can be used either as a vegetable or as a meat alternative, but they can't be used as both in the same meal. So the example with the picture on the screen is that of a beef and bean chili. The menu planner would need to decide if the beans they're using in that chili are going to serve as their bean legume subgroup requirement for the week or going to contribute to the meat, meat alternate component. It's up to the menu planner, but it can't serve as both components in that one meal. These are the weekly vegetable subgroups. We have dark green, which consists of items such as broccoli, spinach, romaine lettuce. The red-orange subgroup consists of items such as tomatoes, red peppers, carrots, sweet potato, winter squash, and pumpkin. Beans and legumes consist of items such as kidney beans, lentils, chickpeas, refried beans, and hummus. The starchy vegetable subgroup consists of items such as white potato, corn, green peas. And there's also an other subgroup. And this is not a catch-all. This is not um, for any extra vegetables you serve. This is an actual subgroup with specific vegetables in it that must be offered over the course of the week. The other subgroup consists of items such as iceberg lettuce, green beans, beets, and onions. And I underlined green beans on this slide just to um, point out that the color of a vegetable does not necessarily indicate the subgroup that it will be in. So green beans are not in the green subgroup, the 
actually fall in the other subgroup. It's all based on the nutrient contact, content of the vegetable. This is the vegetable subgroup chart, which shows you that yes, every single day, three quarter cup of vegetables, any type of vegetables must be offered to students, grades K through eight, and one cup, grades nine through 12. And then the vegetable subgroups, over the course of the week, you have minimum amounts of the subgroups that must be offered. So um, what I want to point out on this screen is that you'll notice the red orange subgroup is a little bit higher in terms of the amount that must be offered over the week than any of the other subgroups. So just make sure when you're doing your menu planning that you have red, orange vegetables on there um, probably more than once to make sure that that subgroup is being, being met. This is the vegetable subgroup chart that probably many of you are familiar with. It's also a handout on today's webinar. And many of you, I see this in a lot of kitchens when I'm out on reviews. This is a great reference chart. And if ever there's a time when perhaps an item comes in um, and it's been substituted or perhaps the quality isn't good, you can always look at this chart and ideally you would find another vegetable in the same subgroup to substitute that with to ensure that the subgroups are met over the course of the week. Now we're going to play a quick game of name that vegetable subgroup. Here in front of us is spinach, so all of you should be thinking what subgroup is this in? And hopefully you're all saying dark green. Iceberg lettuce. Iceberg lettuce is in the other subgroup. Corn. Corn is in the starchy vegetable subgroup. Green beans. Green beans are in the other subgroup. Beet. Beets are in the other subgroup. Tomatoes. Tomatoes are in the red-orange subgroup. Peas. Peas are in the starchy vegetable subgroup. Green pepper. Green peppers in the other vegetable subgroup. When planning your menus, many of you um, offer an alternate choice with your meal. So you might have the main meal option, but then for example, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, that's an alternate choice for students who don't want the main meal. Vegetable subgroups need to be offered to all students regardless of the meal that they select. So on the screen right here are two examples. One is a meal choice that's hot dogs with baked beans. So that's when you have baked beans in the pot, you cut up the hot dogs and serve it all together. Or an alternate choice of peanut butter and jelly sandwich, carrot sticks, fruit, and milk. And it does look like that meal is missing a grain with it, so that's a problem. Um, example number two, you'll notice the hot dog is served on a bun. The alternate choice is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and the baked beans are offered as a side item to either meal, along with the carrot sticks, the fresh fruit, and the milk. So with example number one, those beans are only being offered with the main choice. It's not being offered with the alternate choice. So that would be a meal pattern finding. Another option, if you still want to serve the hot dogs in with the beans, is to also have some beans on the side that you can offer to the students taking the alternate sandwich choice. But the point here is that all vegetables, if you're counting them towards meeting your vegetable requirements, they must be offered with all meal choices. I'm going to move on to the grain components. All grains that are offered in the school lunch program must be whole grain rich. Again, as we talked about earlier, there are both daily and weekly minimum amounts of grains that have to be offered. There are no maximums. So these are minimum amounts that must be offered. 
And as I mentioned earlier, if you're only planning your menu to meet the minimum amount at the K-8 level, you won't meet your weekly amount. So it's really important, K through 8, that you offer more than one ounce equivalent of grains a day to make sure those weekly minimums are met. As I mentioned, all grains must be whole grain rich. This means that they're made with at least half or the majority of whole grain ingredients. So in front of us, we have two product labels. The first ingredient of the product on the left-hand side of the screen says enriched wheat flour. The first ingredient on the label on the left-hand side of the screen says whole wheat. Enriched wheat flour is not whole grain rich. It's really important when looking at the product labels for your bread, tortillas, um, dinner rolls, hot dog rolls, hamburger rolls, that the first ingredient says whole wheat or whole something. That word whole is key in identifying a whole grain rich item um, for a prepackaged item. And sometimes the labels can be quite confusing. This is an example of a bread product. And you can see the front of the package says whole grains, honey wheat made with whole grain bread. So it certainly gives the look and feel of a whole grain product. But when you flip that package over and you look at the ingredient label, you'll notice that the very first ingredient listed says enriched wheat flour. So this is not a whole grain rich product. It is made with whole grain as the front of the label says, because if you look further down the ingredient list, it does have some whole wheat flour in the product. It's just not enough, not the majority of the grain or at least half of the grain in the product to then be called whole grain rich. So read those ingredient labels um, and check them throughout the year too, because subs happen um, and sometimes Distributors can change products or um, recipes change. So make sure you're always checking your labels and getting the correct product. A great resource for you when trying to determine if something is whole grain rich or not, look at the whole grain resource for the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Programs. This is a USDA document um, and it's fabulous. I reference this often when I have a question about if a product is whole grain rich or not. So the website is um, listed on your screen. I recommend you um, go find this resource and bookmark it to your computer. I think it would be quite handy for you. I also just want to let you know if you aren't currently aware, there is a whole grain waiver available. So this would be for a product that or products that you just are having a hard time getting student acceptance for, or perhaps you're just having a hard time finding the availability, perhaps the, um, the vent, your distributors aren't carrying it, or the store where you pick up your bread does not carry it, and you're just struggling with getting um, a whole grain rich compliant product. There is a waiver form available it's on our website under forms, and then if you scroll down under management forms, you'll see waiver request whole grain rich waiver. So you can complete that form and send it into our office. Once it's approved, we will let you know, and then you are allowed to purchase um, the product for which you've received the exemption, um, and it would still count towards the meal pattern. Moving on to the meat, meat alternate components. Again, there are both daily and weekly minimum amounts that must be offered to students. And just like the grains, the meat meat alternate are offered in ounce equivalents. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Meat, fish, poultry, those are all um, items that fall in this component. And for meat alternate items, that would consist of eggs, cheese, yogurt, nut butters, and beans if you're not using the beans as a vegetable subgroup. So we've gone through all of the five food components that must be offered. There are also some other items that, while you can serve them, they don't count towards the meal pattern because they don't contribute the nutrition required to be in one of those food components. So we call these extra foods or thank you for coming foods. Items such as cream cheese, bacon, salami, an item that's not whole grain rich, 
you don't have the waiver, popcorn, potato chips, and condiments. So it doesn't mean that you can't serve these items, it just means that they don't count towards the meal packet. So we've gone through the meal pattern chart for lunch, um, and we've made reference to the fact that milk, fruit, and vegetables are all offered in cups and measured in cups, and grains and meat meat alternate are offered in ounce equivalent. And this is all to help us determine how an item credits towards the meal pattern. It's important to know um, these measurements of cup and ounce equivalent. So for crediting of grain, basically what we're doing is trying to determine the actual amount of grain, the grain food component, that's in a food product, such as a muffin. Because as you all know, there are other ingredients in that muffin as well. There's sugar, there are eggs, there might be blueberries, so we need to know how much grain is in that product to determine how it counts towards the grain food component. So what is an ounce equivalent? For a grain, one ounce, which is 28 grams, of a whole grain, 100% whole grain food is an ounce equivalent, or if it's a whole grain rich item, it's the amount of food that's containing 16 grams of whole grain ingredients. So when you have grains, you usually either purchase a pre-made item or you're making it yourself in your own kitchen, a scratch-made item. So for a scratch-made item, you would look at the recipe and calculate the total amount of grain in that recipe to determine how it credits towards the meal pattern. In case any of you, your heads are spinning right now just thinking about that, you can always reach out to any of the reviewers in our office and we will be glad to assist you. Um, with crediting some of your recipes. It's something we do um, quite often um, and are happy to assist you. So don't let that stop you from serving an item if you just don't know how to credit your recipe. Reach out to us, please. With pre-made items, such as a bagel, sandwich bread, pretzels, um, there are multiple resources you can use to determine how that, those products credit. You can use Exhibit A, or we also call it the grain chart, and that was a handout as well for today's webinar. Some manufacturers will offer a product formulation statement where they tell you specifically, they do the math for you, specifically how much creditable grain was in that product and therefore how the product credits towards the meal pattern. Some items, um, you'll see this not for a, a straight grain item, but if it's combined with a meat meat alternate. So for example, a breaded chicken patty or pizza, pre-made pizza. Those items might have a child nutrition or a CN label, which will tell you specifically how they credit. So you can use that information. And there's also USDA food fact sheet. So for any grain items that you're getting as USDA foods, there's a fact sheet available that will tell you specifically how that item credits. Using the Exhibit A grain chart, there are two columns on the chart. The column on the left-hand side groups grain products, um, groups similar grain products. And then on the right-hand side, it'll tell you the minimum serving size for an ounce equivalent. So the example on the slide here, if we had a package of crackers, let's say we had some saltine crackers, and we wanted to figure out how many we needed to serve, we would find crackers in our Exhibit A handout, and it's found here under Group A. And then looking over on the right-hand side, a one ounce equivalent serving would be 22 grams or 0.8 ounces of crackers. So then you would refer to the package. It should tell you on the package itself of saltines how many individual crackers are in ounce or are they are 28 grams and you would do the math from there. So you're going to use the nutrient fact panel from your product along with this chart to determine how an item would credit. So I realize you may not all have the exhibit A chart in front of you, but if you do, you can refer to that. On the screen we have three grain items in front of us. We have a point eight ounce bag of pretzels, we have a two ounce blueberry muffin, and we have a half cup of cooked rice. So the question is, which one of these 
is a one ounce equivalent? And the answer is they all are. Using the grain chart, you'll notice a half cup of cooked rice is a one ounce equivalent of grain. A two ounce fruit muffin, not a cornmeal muffin, that credits differently, but a two ounce fruit muffin credits as one ounce equivalent. And a 0.8 ounce bag of pretzels, yes, I realize it's less than one ounce, a one ounce serving, but that 0.8 ounce bag of pretzels has 16 grams of creditable grain in it. And that's why all of those credit as a one ounce equivalent. With scratch made items, I mentioned earlier, you would take the recipe and you would convert the grams of grain in the recipe. You would divide that by the number of servings that the recipe serves and then divide it again by 16 grams of creditable grain in an ounce equivalent. And that will tell you how that item credits. And again, please reach out for us if you need any assistance with crediting your recipes. So with meat, meat alternate, it's a similar concept. Um, we're trying to determine the amount of actual meat in a product. So you could have two ounces of chicken nuggets, and they don't necessarily contain two ounces of actual chicken. And that's because they're fillers and there's breading on the product. So it's not all chicken. Same with your deli meats. There's fillers, there's water. There was two ounce portion of deli turkey, for example, does not actually contain two ounces of meat. A whole muscle product, like a chicken breast, is ounce for ounce because there's no other fillers or breading um, on that product. So it's just important to know that your processed meat items do not count ounce for ounce. So to determine how these items uh, credit towards the meal pattern or contribute to the meat, meat alternate food component group, you would either use the food buying guide for some unprocessed items, or if you're buying a processed item like a sausage patty, chicken, processed chicken products, pre-made pizza, you would want to purchase a product that has a child nutrition label on it because that means they've already done the testing and the math to determine how it contributes to the meal pattern. If it's a USDA food, you would again reference that USDA food fact sheet. Some processed items are in the food buying guide, um, or you could also reach out to the manufacturer, not your distributor, but the manufacturer, the company making the product, and ask them if they have a product formulation statement. But without any of those resources, if you're buying a chicken nugget and it does not have a CN label or product formulation statement, there's, we can determine how much meat meat alternate is in that product. For your meat alternatives, these are um, all the serving sizes that would credit as a one ounce equivalent. So cheese is ounce for ounce, so one ounce of cheese, like those cheese sticks many of you use, is a one ounce equivalent of meat alternative. Two tablespoons of nut butter is a one meat alternate. 1.6 ounce of deli turkey, 1.2 ounces of deli ham, and four ounces of yogurt is one meat meat alternate. So the resources I just touched on, the Exhibit A, Grain Requirement, the Food Buying Guide, Child Nutrition or CN Labels, and Product Formulation Statements are all resources that are very important um, that you'll need to determine how items contribute to the meal pattern. The Food Buying Guide is a great resource. This is the website um, where you can download it or bookmark it, and it's broken into the different meal components a great resource you can use um, all the time. We also have a main DOE YouTube video to walk you through how to use the food buying guide. The end labels, talking a little bit about those, um, it is a voluntary 
program, so that's why you'll notice not all products have a CN label. It does cost the company money to go through the process um, because it does mean that their product has been evaluated to determine how it contributes to the meal pattern. You'll find CN labels if they are available for your main dish, meat, meat alternate, and grain products, either a combined process product or just a meat, meat alternate process product. This is just an example of what a CN label will look like. I know some distributors on their own web pages, you can print off nutrition information and it will say it has a CN label, but you need the actual CN label from the product itself or from the manufacturer. We um, don't accept CN labels from your distributor. So your CN label should look something like this. You'll see a rectangular box with the CN initials around all four sides of the box. And it will tell you specifically, um, for example, here with the chicken nuggets, it tells you specifically that 5.64 ounce fully cooked breaded nugget shaped chicken patties provides two ounce equivalent meat meat alternate and one ounce equivalent grains. So if you serve five chicken nuggets, that will be a two meat, one grain serving. Product formulation statements. If, a, if you're finding the product you're purchasing doesn't have a CN label, you could reach out to the distributor, excuse me, the, the uh, manufacturer to see if they have a formulation statement, which again will document how the product contributes to the meal pattern. And that would be acceptable, um, acceptable documentation, just like the CN label. We do have YouTube, available, YouTube videos available. This would count towards your professional standard training hours if you watch any of these, just to document that you've done that. Um, and we do have a video available on crediting grains if you want additional information on that. So some tips when you're planning your menu, um, or if you're not the menu planner and you're the person preparing and serving, you should be reviewing the menu. Um, and I always recommend planning a two grain and a two meat every single day, regardless of your grade group. And that way you know that you're meeting your weekly minimum. And also with vegetable subgroups, there are five vegetable subgroups and there are five days of the week. So when looking through your menu, do a quick scan and make sure all five subgroups are being touched on five days in the week. For those who do have salad bars, it's a great way to meet subgroup requirements. Um, however, I do recognize that's not reality for all schools. So you just need to make sure, again, the subgroups are being offered at the serving window in that case. So everything up to this point that we've talked about has to do with what's offered to students making sure that uh, meal pattern requirements are being offered. So moving forward, we're now gonna talk about a concept called offer versus serve. So what we're talking about from this point forward will be what the student has to select for that cashier to recognize that meal as reimbursable. So you must offer all the five meal components at lunch. But my question is, do students have to take all of them? And the answer is no, they do not. With offer versus serve, while you do have to offer all five components, at a minimum, a reimbursable lunch, so what the student selects on their tray, must contain three different food components. <laughs> One of those components has to be at least a half cup fruit or vegetable, or a combination of both. So the student must take three different components, one of which half cup fruit or veggie. So this is just a visual of what offer versus serve would look like. Here on this tray, you've offered all five meal components. And the student has declined two of them. They declined the fruit and they declined the milk, but they've selected the grain, the vegetable, and the meat, meat alternate. The great thing about offer versus serve is that it does allow students to have 
a choice, somewhat of a choice. I mean, there still are some minimum things that they must take for a meal to be reimbursable, but they don't, if they really don't want a milk with their meal, they're not required to take a milk as long as they have three different components. And because of that, it's one way to help reduce food waste. It is required that high schools implement offer versus serve, and it is optional at the elementary level. However, I find that most elementary schools um, are using this. So now it's time for meal or no meal. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to put on the screen an image of a lunch tray with what's offered for lunch today. And then once you see what's offered, the next slides will be what the student has selected. And we're all going to think to ourselves whether or not the lunch that the student has selected is a reimbursable lunch or not under offer versus serve. So on this day, what we have in front of us is um, offer, what's offered for lunch is spaghetti with meat sauce. So this is a combined meat and grain entree. One cup of salad. And if you remember from earlier on, one cup of lettuce is considered a half cup serving vegetable. So we're going to consider that salad a half cup serving vegetable, half cup of green beans, and one cup of fruit. And that's what's being offered on the menu today. The student comes to the line, and this is what's on their tray. Is this a reimbursable meal? I'm hoping you all said yes. This meal is reimbursable because at least three different components were selected, and the meal also includes a half cup of fruit or vegetable. And actually, this meal, five components were selected. They have the meat and the grain and the spaghetti with meat sauce, the milk, the vegetable, and the fruit. The next student comes through the line, and this is what's on their tray. Is this lunch reimbursable? I have a feeling that some of you are saying yes and some of you are saying no. The answer is yes. While many of us would prefer to see an entree on this tray, the regulations state that a reimbursable meal must have three different components selected. We have fruit, we have vegetable, we have milk. And out of those three, one must be at least a half cup fruit or vegetable. So we can answer those questions as true, therefore this is a reimbursable meal. The next student comes through the line and they take the spaghetti with meat sauce, the one cup of lettuce, which is a half cup serving vegetable, and a cup of milk. Is this a reimbursable meal? Yeah, at least three components have been selected three different components, and it includes a half cup fruit or vegetable. The next student comes through the line. They have a cup of milk, half cup green beans, the one cup of salad, which contributes a half cup, and a cup of fruit. Is this a reimbursable meal? Again, yes, three different components selected, fruit, vegetable, milk, and a half cup fruit is one of those. The next day for lunch, we are offering a pepperoni pizza. And while pepperoni does not contribute to the meal pattern, um, there's enough cheese on this product. So it's a two meat, two grain serving of pizza. There's a half cup of cucumbers, which are from the other subgroup. We have one cup fruit in the form of an apple and a half cup of carrot sticks from the red orange vegetable subgroup and again we're offering milk the student comes through the line i'm sure none of you ever see a tray that looks like this student comes through the line and they have the pizza the milk and two carrot sticks is this a reimbursable meal i hope you're all saying no um, although this tray does have three components, they have the grain, 
the meat from the pizza and they have milk, they do not have a half cup vegetable or fruit. They have two carrot sticks, which is not a full serving size to count towards the meal pattern. So we have to ask the student to kindly go back and select some additional fruit or vegetable to their tray um, if they want to take the reimbursable meal. The other option here is that you can charge the student a la carte prices um, if they don't want additional fruit or vegetable. So here's a student who went back and they took an apple. They have the pizza and they have two carrot sticks as well. Is this a reimbursable meal? And the answer is yes. Again, they have three components. They have the fruit in the form of an apple and they have the pizza, which is a two meat and two grain ounce equivalent product. So this is a reimbursable meal, even though the carrots don't contribute to the meal pattern um, because they haven't selected enough of them. So you'll notice that milk is not required to be selected. On the next day for lunch, we're offering one cup of watermelon, half cup of corn, which is in the starchy vegetable subgroup, a half cup of broccoli, which is in the dark green vegetable subgroup. We have a beef and bean burrito, which is a two meat, two grain entree. And we have a cup of milk in the form of fat-free chocolate milk. Is this meal reimbursable? We have the beef and bean burrito, which is the two meat, two grain, and we have a half cup corn. And the answer is yes. We have three different components that were selected, including a half cup vegetable. The next student in line selected the burrito and the milk. Is this reimbursable? The answer is no. They have the two meat, two grain burrito, and they have the chocolate milk, so they have three components, but they're missing the half cup fruit or vegetable. So unless we knew how much vegetable was in that burrito, which we did not know, we, didn't, we weren't told that on that menu planning slide um, with this tray, we can't count the vegetable in there. Is this lunch reimbursable? I have a feeling some of you are saying no. Some might be saying yes. And the correct answer is yes. Again, an entree is not required to be taken. So this student has the one cup of watermelon, a half cup corn, and a milk. So they have three different components. And they have at least a half cup vegetable in this case. So this is a reimbursable meal. So that's the end of our meal or no meal. And I just want to talk about field trips for a minute. Um, unless you are implementing offer versus serve for your field trip, meaning that students are able to self-select what they want in their field trip bag lunch, you must continue to follow meal pattern requirements, which means that you have to offer all five meal components in the full serving size. So, <coughs> excuse me, that would mean you have to offer milk for fruit, depending on your age or grade group, you'd have to offer either a half cup or one cup fruit, three quarter cup or one cup vegetables, one ounce equivalent or two ounce equivalent grain, and one ounce equivalent or two ounce equivalent meat meat alternate for your K-8 and your 9-12 grade groups. I know that some schools will have students pre-order, so if they're aware of the field trip ahead of time, they have a form that they can either send home or distribute through the teacher that allows the student to select the type of sandwich they want, the type of fruit, the type of vegetable, the type of milk. And that way, um, as long as the student is selecting three different components and they have the half cup fruit or vegetable, you can um, apply offer versus serve um, to a field trip bag lunch. There are some additional requirements to the meal pattern um, or to lunch service that must be followed in addition to what we've already talked about today. One is, and this actually applies to both breakfast and lunch, and that's that students must have access to free potable water. So if there's a water fountain in the cafeteria or right outside of the cafeteria that they are allowed to have access to, 
then you're meeting that requirement. Or if you have uh, one of those Cambro containers or covered pitchers that you can put out and students can have access to water, then um, you're meeting this requirement. What you're not allowed to do is distribute Poland Spring bottles of water because that's an unallowable expense to your program. Um, you can't also serve water in place of milk. That is not allowable. But they just have to have access to water, again, either through a, a pitcher or a water fountain, and then you're meeting this requirement. And again, that's for both breakfast and lunch service, so that applies. The other requirement is meal pa excuse me, meal signage. Um, for both breakfast and lunch, you need to have some signage available that tells students how they can make a reimbursable meal. Um, the signage has to be available prior to the beginning of the serving line. So, um, and the signage also needs to include the requirement that they select at least a half cup of fruit or a vegetable. So, it's not just enough to simply post up your menu. You need some sort of signage that tells students that they need at least three different it depends on the terminology you want to use, but three different food groups, um, including a half cup fruit or vegetable. So there, if you do a Google search online, there are some creative ways um, that schools have done this. Um, I was on a review earlier this year, and the school took one of their lunch trays and they photocopied it on a color printer, and they laminated it. And then every day they write in what's for lunch and they have a sign right next to it that says must take at least three, I don't know what, again, the terminology they use, but to, must take at least three things, include a half cup fruit or vegetable. I've also been to sites that, as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, they'll portion up a sample meal to show kids what it actually looks like. And they put it on a colorful plate with a colorful napkin underneath and it just makes for a really attractive looking display and can entice students to want to take that meal. Um, and if you pair that with a menu um, saying what's for lunch and what at a minimum they would need to select, that could also be used as your meal signage. So the important thing is that you have something available that tells kids how to make a reimbursable meal. And if you think about it at um, a level, I'm thinking a high school level where you're selling most likely you're selling some additional a la carte items, it's really important because if you're a student walking into that cafeteria and there are a variety of meal choices, but then there's also some a la carte items available, how does that child know what they can select for a meal? How do they know that the um, chips are not included in the meal or some of those side snack items that are being sold a la carte? So we have completed today's webinar, and at this point in time, we do have some time left for questions. If you have any questions, you can type them into the um, question bar on the side of your screen. And if you don't have any questions, it's fine to leave the webinar at this time. As I mentioned in the beginning, certificates of attendance will be mailed out, um, I believe, within two days or so after the completion of the webinar. If multiple people are watching the webinar in one location, it's fine to use a sign-in sheet and attach it with that certificate of attendance or some sort of documentation that multiple people we're viewing the webinar on this date, and that would serve as your do documentation for um, professional standards. Looks like I have a question asking if it's mandatory to have signage 
for offer versus serve. I believe I'm reading that question correctly. It, yes, it is mandatory to have signage, letting students know what needs to be selected to make a reimbursable meal. So with offer versus serve for lunch, that means they would have to select at least three of the components and one must be the half cup fruit or vegetable. I have another question here that says, for soups like corn chowder, do you allow a half cup starchy vegetable to credit? So the answer is yes, if there's a half cup corn and potato, white potato in that corn chowder. My next question to you though would be, is that corn chowder offered to all students? So the example that we gave earlier in the webinar with the hot dogs and baked beans, where those baked beans in the first example were only being offered to students taking the main meal and not to the students taking the alternate choice. That was a problem because the subgroup wasn't being offered to all students. So with your corn chowder, you absolutely can use that to credit towards the starchy subgroup and to for your vegetable servings for the day. However, I would only do that if that corn chowder is being offered to with, with all meal choices. And it looks like that's all we've received for questions. I appreciate your time today. Um, if you do have any further questions or need to get in touch um, with me for any reason, feel free to reach out to myself or to any of the reviewers. Our next webinar will be on January 23rd, again at 1.30. And at that webinar, we'll be reviewing the breakfast meal pattern and ways to boost participation in your breakfast program. You will need to register for that, again, on our website under events, and we look forward to seeing you in January. Have a wonderful vacation, everybody.